Greetings, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another sermonic moment from the Abyssinia Baptist Church, where I have the honor and the privilege to serve as the senior pastor. It is always my prayer that the blessings of the Lord have once again filled your cups until they've overflowed. From the smallest child to the eldest saint, Today, the Lord has graced us and given us another Sunday morning to worship him. Even though today we are entering into our seventh week of being separated from the house of prayer, but thanks be to God, we are not separated from him, neither are we separated from one another. For even in this moment of physical separation, we are still united in the spirit. So again, I welcome you and I pray that today's message will be of an encouragement to your soul. And I do want to share with you that at the conclusion of our message today, we will virtually observe the ordinance, one of the ordinances of the church the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. So we ask that if you have bread or cracker or something in your household uh, that is handy to you that can represent the Lord's body, as well as a cup of some form of liquid, some juice or water or whatever you have in your house that might serve as the cup of the new covenant representing the Lord's blood, we ask that you would gather that uh, so that you would readily have that available to you at the conclusion of today's message. We do ask that you would join us in the Lord's Supper. Now let us prepare for today's message that is entitled, Lord, Keep My Mind. Let us pray. Eternal, all-wise God, our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for the richness of your blessing that you have showered down into our lives and sprinkled upon this day that we might be able to once again gather together around your word. We pray, O oh God, that through your spirit you would speak to us in this forum, speak to our minds, speak to our hearts, speak to our spirits. O oh Lord, we know that there is a word that is good for us, to receive today to help to us to become better and made more like you. And even today, O oh Lord, if there's anybody who's experiencing some situation in their life, we ask, O oh God, that this word would address it, that it might encourage them to look to you, the author and the finisher of their faith. But not only that, God, you are the provider of all of our needs. So Lord, now in this time, we ask that you would speak through your spirit into our hearts that we might hear from you. This we do ask and pray in the mighty and blessed name of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. All right, so today's message shall be found, uh, the scripture for it will be found in the book of Philippians. Philippians, the fourth chapter, where we shall read in your hearing verses 6 and 7. That's Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. If you would turn with that with me in your Bibles, on your electronic devices, uh, that we might read along together in the Word of God. There you will find these words written by the Apostle Paul. He says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen, amen. What a powerful proclamation <clears throat> made by the Apostle Paul. Lord, keep my mind. 
We are hearing today more open conversations about mental health illnesses. Now, once upon a time, at the mere mentioning of those words, mental health, folk would be ready to call and make you a reservation at St. Elizabeth Hospital over in Southeast D.C. But today, mental health issues encompasses much more than what was originally thought just to be someone diagnosed with a mental imbalance. And some of the issues that are prevalent today are just as disruptive to a person's life as a mental imbalance. Issues such as depression, anxiety, dementia, and of late we're learning of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And there are other behavioral dysfunctions that are being recognized. And while we hear of those things, there are other more subtle issues that also affects one's mental health. Issues like mood swings, worries, stress. Things that may not immediately land you on a counselor's couch, but they still have a way of disrupting the tranquility of life and the tranquility of a peaceful day. But whatever the particular issue might be, the, the intent behind it is to rob us of the fullness of life that God desires that we not only have, but experience. So the question then becomes, why would a loving father allow such conditions as these to impact our lives in the manner in which they do. And I believe that the short answer to the question is that so we would depend more on Jesus Christ. But yet we must understand that Jesus Christ is not the author, neither is he the cause of the things that challenges man's mental, physical, and spiritual health. That is exclusively the work of Satan. The one who exasperates the, the pressures of day-to-day -day life, amplifying circumstances in our life to the point that they become an ongoing thought, like one of those songs that gets stuck in your head that you lock in on and it just plays over and over again. Well, the truth be told, we have the tendency to do the same thing with those things that causes us stress and worry until we are consumed by it and then our behavior begins to change. And now, I don't want anybody to think that I'm condemning anyone for experiencing stress because if truth be told, we all will, from time to time, experience stress in our lives because none of us are perfect. And that's not what Paul is talking about in this particular section of scripture. What Paul is seeking to share with us today is that even when stress and worries and these issues do arise in our life, there is an answer, there is an antidote that will, that will counter the pressures of life and the wiles of the devil so that we might not only set a perfect pattern for others to follow, but to follow that pattern ourselves. I've learned that it is foolish, it is a foolish notion to think that one can prescribe a path for others to walk and not walk that path 
themselves. And so what we're finding is the prescription that is revealed unto us as we contend with all of life's pressures, I believe was initially uh, exposed in Isaiah, the 26th chapter and the third verse, where you would find these words, and they're good words. There's a good verse of scripture to remember and to lock in on. It said, the, the prophet says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. The prophet is merely just telling us that the God, our creator, will, will keep us in perfect peace if we keep our mind focused, stayed on him. And the reason why he would do this is because we have put our trust in him. And so I don't know about anybody else, but my daily prayer, my daily request is, Lord, keep my mind. But even with that verse of scripture and with that particular request, still the Apostle Paul gives us six steps in this fourth chapter that a believer must take if they are to maintain the peace of God. And these steps, they were critical to the church at Philippi at the time of Paul's writing, and they are just as critical and crucial for believers today in the church of Jesus Christ as we set the example before our family, our friends, and even the world on how to live as citizens of God's kingdom. You know, it's, it's a bad thing that to be a citizen of God's kingdom and every time a matter arises in our life, we get so consumed by it. We, we start falling to pieces over it. We get stressed out over it because then the question becomes, well, where is God? Where is your faith? And so Paul establishes for us in this fourth chapter six steps that we should consider and we should uh, be in tune to as we try to maintain the peace of God in our request that the Lord would keep our minds. And now I'll briefly touch on the first Four, but I really want us to concentrate today on the fifth and the sixth step. But the first step that Paul talks about, we will find in the very first verse of the scripture where he says, so stand fast in the Lord. So, so the first step that Paul is telling us is we've got to stand firm. We must realize that the source of our strength is in the Lord. We cannot navigate and handle the pressures of this world on our own. It doesn't matter how strong you think you are, there's a pressure in this world that can break down even the strongest of us if we believe we can rely solely upon ourselves. Therefore, Paul is telling us the first step that we must do is we must learn how to stand firm in the Lord and not be tossed about by every contrary wind. Yes, we are going to have stress. We are going to have worries. These things are going to arise in our life and they're going to concern us. But yet Paul says, stand firm in the Lord. The second step that Paul takes us to, we're found in the second verse where he says, be of the same mind in the Lord. And so what Paul is doing here, he, he's talking about promoting 
unity. Just as we can't stand alone, we can't live alone. We need the fellowship of other believers. And I, I know that the more people, the greater the chances of conflict, for, for we always will not always agree. But even when we disagree, we are to conduct ourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, communicating with one another, celebrating each other's special events, lets us know that we are not alone in this world. And too many of us have struggled in isolation because they felt as though they didn't have anyone who would understand what they were going through. Well, we might not understand the specifics of another person's uh, uh, dilemma, but we've all had our own issues to contend with. And the Bible calls us together to strengthen one another. But you can't do that if you're all by yourself. Isolation, my brothers and sisters, is Satan's playground. And to the capacity of our own ability. We are our brother's keeper, and fellowshipping helps us to break the grip of isolation. But then the third step that Paul issues unto us and shares with us today is found in verse number four. He says, rejoice in the Lord. So look at what he's telling. He says, stand firm in the Lord. Then he says, be of the same mind in the Lord. And now he says, rejoice in the Lord. Paul is telling us that no matter what life sends our way, rejoice. Yes, there will be times when we will experience discouragement. There are going to be days when we're going to have setbacks. Things that can weigh us down and weigh heavy on our mind are going to come upon us. In it. But it is in these times that we need to remind ourselves of God's promises and trust in his timing. <coughs> Excuse me. You see, a lot of people want to put God on their timetable. But if God said that he would do it, then just believe that he would do it and trust that he would do it in just the right time. We must remember that the Lord is faithful to his word and he'll be faithful to his children because and because of his faithfulness, we can rejoice. But then the fourth step that Paul injects unto us today he says in verse number five, let your moderation be known unto all men. Let your moderation be known unto all men. Another passage or another translation says, let your gentleness be evident to all. And what he's doing here, he is reminding us to be humble, to be courteous, to be patient, to be considerate to not only those who are our fellow believers, but also unto those who are unbelievers as well. Yes, sometimes we may be under the pressures of life and where we have the tendency to forget who we are and whose we are. And we will find that our attitudes will change. Our inter interactions with others will become harsh. The, the pressures contained on the inside of us become the pressures exposed on the outside of us as we launch out and uh, uh, holler out at other folks. We lose our footing and then explode for the pressure that is not diffused will eventually erupt. And this is why I, I say that, you know, even as we're going back, going through it on a daily basis, it ought to be our constant prayer. Lord, keep my mind, keeping my mind and that I might continue to be the example that you're calling for me to be 
in this day and time. And so that brings me down to this fifth step. And the verses of scripture that I have read in your hearing from the book today, to me, the, the steps five and six seems to consolidate the other four as we look at the constant unveiling of day-to-day -day pressures. Yesterday's pressures may be different from today's. You conquer one Mount one moment and only to find that another moment is raging before you to the point that you began to wonder, is there really any relief? Well, Paul tells us in our passage today in the sixth verse, he says unto us, be careful for nothing. The Amplified Version of the Bible translates it and says, don't fret or have anxiety about anything. Now I know that's a hard pill to swallow, but no matter what materializes in our day, Paul is telling us, don't worry about it, don't stress over it, don't even waste your time beating yourself up about it. For the reality is none of those actions has the power to change what you've experienced in any way. But like I said, I've been on this earth long enough to know that that's easier said than done. Because knowing that if we can't change it, we'll end up worrying about it. And then we'll worry until we begin to stress over it. And this gives Satan the opportunity to consume our thoughts and break our spirits. And before you know it, we'll begin having mental health issues and health issues and emotional issues because Satan has been true to form, knowing that he only comes to kill your spirit and to steal your joy and to destroy your state of mind over some of the most trivial things. But it is for this reason Paul encourages us to be anxious over nothing, not over the necessities of life, not over the sufferings of persecution, not even over the disturbances in the body or the carnality of our fellow believers. He says, be anxious over nothing. Whatever trial, whatever temptation, whatever trouble may arise, remember there is a supernatural power available unto us all. And one can tap into it through step number six. He says, and in everything by prayer and supplication. Well, step number six, he is saying, pray. Pray because prayer has a transformational power. It's present. It presents to the mind and the heart that which, one, that which one has been carrying, that burden that you have been carrying, that stress that has been stressing you out, that trouble that has causing you to lose a night's sleep, those worries that you keep tossing over and over again. Paul says, if you pray, you have a place to lay them down where someone who is much greater than you can handle it. But still, you will benefit from it. Continuing, Paul says, the attitude of prayer is just as important as the prayer itself. That's why he continues saying, not only pray, but pray with thanksgiving and let your requests be made known unto God. You see, the fact is that you can take it to God and believe that he can handle it. 
that is enough to, to lift your spirit and to encourage your heart. And when you know you can put it in God's hand and he cares enough to take the strain and relieve the tension, one should go to him, not in disgust or not in disdain, but in total appreciation. When we have an attitude of Thanksgiving, even before you receive the relief that you seek, it sets a level of trust in God that says, Lord, I know that you can do whatever I ask. I know and I believe that you are able to handle it. It says, Lord, I am standing on your promises and I am trusting in your word. It says, and I thank you for lifting up my burdens. I, I thank you for relieving this stress. I thank you for removing my worries and I thank you for restoring my joy. I don't have to wait for it to happen because I trust that you will come through. <clears throat> and Paul says, as we perform these six steps, he says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Just think about that. Just going through those six little steps. He says, that's all you need to do and you will find that the peace of God will transcend. In other words, it will come down and fill your life and fill your heart and fill your mind with understanding. And it won't only just fill it, but it will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful blessing it is to receive through Christ in, <clears throat> in the midst of all of life's trials and burdens and struggles and difficulty to be able to receive the peace of God. So my brothers and sisters, no matter what you may be experiencing in your life today, don't worry about it. But do as the old, thank, old saints used to say, take it to the Lord in prayer. And if you will do that, you will find that he will keep your mind in perfect peace. Just ask him, Lord, keep my mind. And I feel that this, this word is particularly applicable to us now because so much has changed in recent days in our lives. Activities and things that we once were so accustomed and did so freely, we have now become so restricted and confined and unable to do. But yet even in this day and time, no matter what you are going through, no matter what you are experiencing, if you would pray and ask the Lord to keep your mind, he will. This relief, I must admonish you though, only come to those who have received Jesus Christ as their personal savior. And so I must stress to you Having Christ in your life is well worth the daily comforts that he will provide. Because there are some of us who can give the testimony that if it had not been for Christ, we would have lost our mind. Some of the things that we have gone through, some of the experiences that we have had to endure and to contend with, if Christ had not been there keeping us, then we may not be here. And so you must have received Christ in order to receive the benefit of these promises. And so I encourage you today to open your heart to him and let him bring in 
that peace that passes all understanding. That peace that he so freely desires to give. Pray with me. Lord, I pray that truly you will keep our minds in the midst of all of life circumstances. Whatever it is that we are experiencing today in our life, whatever it is, God, that feel as though it is weighing us down, whatever it is that is altering our behavior, whatever it is that is causing or bringing forth change in our demeanor. Change in such a way, God, that we aren't representing, we're not setting the example as you would have us to, representing and saying that you are the Lord of our life. So whatever it is today, God, we are turning it over. Whatever we're worrying about, every concern, every situation that we've been enduring on our own, we're turning it over to you and we pray that you will grant unto us your peace. Let us walk, O oh God, and be the example for others to follow. We also pray, O oh God, that you would forgive us of any of our sins and if anybody we have wronged, Anybody we have done unjustly, anybody we have treated unfairly, we ask, O oh God, that you will give us the opportunity to return to them, that we might set it right with them. For Lord, we want to be an example of your kindness, an example of your love to our fellow men, that others might seek to know you even as we come to know you. So we ask, oh God, that you would keep our minds in perfect peace. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen, amen, and amen. And now, my brothers and sisters, I do want to let you know that to be able to have this kind of peace, to be able to have this time, this, this kind of, of comfort and consolation, it did not come to us without a cause. In order for us to freely receive, a debt had to be paid. And our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ paid that debt on Calvary's cross. He paid it so that we could have a relationship with him. And in our relationship with him, we could have a relationship with the Father. And in those relationships, we also receive all the promises that God has directed for us to receive. And today you have heard that even in the midst of storms, trials, and tribulations, he has promised us peace. And so even today, we can receive that peace because of what Jesus Christ has done. So we ask that you would get now your communion sacraments that we might bless them and remember what our Lord has done on our behalf so that we could be able to be citizens of God's glorious kingdom. If you have them with you, if not, we give you just a few moments to retrieve them. And while we are waiting on you to retrieve your sacraments, we want to remind you to please uh, visit us at our website at abyssiniabaptistchurch.org uh, where you might be able to receive any of our church announcements. The ministry is still going forward. We're still 
uh, trying to, uh, to reach out and to do the work that our Father has called us in this day and time to do. Uh, and so and instead of me announcing them in this particular time, they're placed on our website and many of you will receive uh, communication from our First Lady, Minister Trice, who sends out emails uh, uh, every Sunday morning. Uh, you will find information provided there, but we also encourage you to visit our website uh, that you might be able to present your tithes and your offerings to continue to do uh, as God has directed for us to do. So visit our website uh, uh, that you might receive additional information that is not passed on to you at this particular time. So now let us go to the Lord's table. The great apostle Paul continues to, to write in the Corinthian letter. He tells us that every man should take the time to examine himself. That as we come to the table, that when we come to partake of the Lord's Supper, we will not eat of the bread or drink of the cup unworthily. For it is Jesus Christ who instituted these supplements by sitting down with his disciples that Thursday evening before he was crucified, where the Bible says he took bread and he broke it. And he says, take ye eat, for this is my body that is broken for you. And he distributed unto the disciples and they ate the bread from bread together. And then in a very same manner, he took a cup and he says, take ye drink. For this is the cup of the New Testament, of the new covenant that I make with you. This is my blood. And he tells us that as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you do show forth my death, my burial, and my resurrection until I come again. But my brothers and sisters, even while we eagerly await and anticipate his coming, it gives us consolation right now to know that he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercessions just for us. So let us remember what he has done. Let us remember and acknowledge what he is doing. And let us rejoice in what he shall do as we receive the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. and we receive the cup of the new covenant. His blood and our souls say, thank you. Let us pray. For the great sacrifice that you have given, for the great amount of love that you have shown, for the tender mercy that you have extended, and for the grace that continues to pour into our life. Oh God, oh Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your only begotten Son. We thank you for his sacrifice for our soul's sake. We bless you and we thank you, God, that now we even have the consolation of knowing that even in the storms in which we face in life, you are still with us. And that if we would only continue to bring our burdens unto you, you would give us your peace. 